coming to tell us about boost super algebras in undeformed and deformed ADS3 CFP tools. Please. Thank you very much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and thank you very much for the organizers for their kind invitation. Um, I, only can, I can only imagine what a tremendous effort it must have been to organize this conference in these days. So um, yeah, it's, it's really wonderful to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about work that I undertook as a, um, I'm now a second year PhD student under the supervision of Alessandro Torielli and Juan Miguel Nieto Garcia, who's also in the audience at the University of Surrey. And the topic is boost superalgebras in the context of ADS3 scattering. And we try to look at it from a lot of different perspectives. So maybe just to give you a quick overview about what I'm trying to talk about. In the beginning, I will try to set up and give a quick motivation and maybe a bit of background for, because I know there's still a lot of PhD students such as myself in the audience um, about the topics that I'm going to talk about, relevant notions, and some of the tools that I'm going to use, such as um, Hopf algebraic language. Before, I will then delve into concrete representations. All representations that I will look at are going to be one plus one short, um, one plus one dimensional short representations. But I will try during this talk to be very clear in what kind of setting that I am. This is because sometimes uh, it will be a massive setting, sometimes it will be a massless setting, sometimes there will be deformation and sometimes not. So please, if you at, ever, at any given point feel a bit lost, um, please uh, just ask. Yes, so after the representation bit, I will also talk about something um, representation independent that we managed to achieve and about some work, works in progress. And in the, in the end, I will also say why, why, why this is interesting, what the motivation is and why we, we are pursuing this further. Okay, so boosts. I'm sure a lot of people, or everybody, um, has met boosts in, immensely during their studies and during their research. All of us know them from the context of Poincaré symmetry when we first learned about them. Um, these are very well-known relations. J is, will always be the boost operator in our context. P, some momentum, and H, the energy, which uh, will sometimes change, but I will try to be also clear about that. Um, why am I talking about uniformizing or uniformized Poincaré? Uh, in the, the idea about uniformized Poincaré or about uniformization is that the boost just appears as a normalized translation operator in our uh, parameter, in our rapidity plane. So for the well-known case of one plus one dimensional uniformized Poincaré, this just means given our Poincaré relations, if we express the boost as a um, differential, as a translation uh, generator of some uh, suitable um, variable, beta in this case, then the Casimir is exactly the relativistic dispersion relation. This is something very well known, and we can also hyperbolically parameterize the momentum and the energy in terms of this variable. Now, this, is, this was for the relativistic case. What if we want to look at the um, Young-Mills case, but if we want to look at the dispersion relation that we are a bit more familiar with? Gomez and Hernandez showed that um, there also exists some kind of algebraic uh, language or some algebraic setting where this dispersion relation appears also as a Casimir of the algebra. And one needs the um, pseudo-kinematic quantum deformed EQ, uh, the two-dimensional EQ algebra for this to be valid. And this is exactly to, this is exactly where we pick up. This is exactly where um, our motivation from boost operators comes from. Um, but I will be a bit precise, more precise about this once I, um, I'm actually talking about what I'm doing. But this is just to give you, this slide is just to give you a rough motivation about where the boost side of the projects comes from. Um, yeah, we're trying to find some remnant of Poincaré symmetry in ADS scattering. And of course, uh, embedded into some Hopf algebraic framework. So what kind of setting are we actually in? Now I'm... I have the pleasure of not having to be so uh, extensive about this because Alessandro's talk was, uh, well, yeah, in a wonderful way, self-containing. Con self 
Uh, just to reiterate, um, so in the ADS3 cross S3 uh, swing theories, kind of the symmetry algebra that we are concerned with is the PSU 1, 1 slash 2 algebra, but we will we'll always just look at a subalgebra of it, namely the one that preserves the vacuum, the one that commutes with the Hamiltonian, as Sandro showed. And uh, we will try to send, or we will centrally extend it. And the relations, the fermionic relations of this algebra, you can see here. Um, in addition to the algebra itself, we also have a well, I out to symmetry. There's actually a much larger group of outer symmetries, which I will talk about later in in a, in a different context. But I'm sure a lot of you know the hypercharge operator and the charges um, of the fermionic operators under it. So this is kind of our ADS part of the setting. Um, now we, we talk about um, kind of deformations and masses. So if we want to look at the eta deformed ADS3, uh, we have to turn on Q deformation. There is a whole, this, there's this whole step story behind this. There's a wonderful construction, but for, for the matters of this talk, just know that when I'm talking about Q deformed algebras, this is for you to say that this in some way corresponds to eta deformed backgrounds. And sometimes, as I said, we will be in a massless scenario and um, sometimes in a massive one. Here, the most important bit that you have to take away from this is the mass in our algebra, if I go back here, um, is really, so if we turn on the mass, the, both the left and the left and the right-handed sector of our algebra are no longer isomorphic. So sometimes it's, it's enough to just look at one, of, one side of the algebra. For example, when we have massless cases and we don't expect kind of a non-trivial interplay between both sides, but as soon as there is a mass, this uh, coupled, this decoupled isomorphic behavior changes or is no longer uh, around. Yes. Okay, so I've talked about now what I find interesting about boosts or what the motivation is for, to think about boosts. And I also talked about the ADS3 uh, context. Now I have to talk about what we will be mostly concerned with in this talk, namely Hopf algebraic language. I'm sure for a lot of you, this is old coffee, but I know that some of you are unfamiliar with it, so I will quickly go through this. So what is a Hopf algebra? Let's say you start with an associative unital uh, algebra. Uh, then you just have to find three maps. So the co-product, the co-unit, and the antipode with these domains and co-domains that satisfy these relations here. Um, I have to say that the co-product is probably the most fundamental of these maps, not only because it appears in all of the, all of the relations that define a Hopf algebra, but it's also the starting point. If you want to construct some kind of Hopf algebra on top of some al algebraic structure, you always start with the co-product because it's the most intricate, I would say. I'm just going to comment on the first uh, of these relations. This is what we know as co-associativity co of the co-product. Why am I stressing this? This will, be, late, this will um, be important later on. And as we will see, sometimes this relation is a, bit more, uh, is a bit more complicated and not really fulfilled, but we have a, we have a way to remedy this. Finally, the most important property about the co-product map that I would stress is that it is a algebra homomorphism. This means that I'm sure you are all familiar with Lie algebra homomorphisms, where um, you know the compatibility with representations and all of that thing. The algebra homomorphism is exactly the same thing, but not that it's own, that not that it just works in uh, by brackets, but it also works in multiplications. So this is in a rather convoluted way, I was trying to say that these, these uh, equations are fulfilled. I just said that um, co-associativity is a bit intricate and sometimes we um, don't have it. If we have an algebraic structure that almost looks like a Hopf algebra, but not quite, um, we sometimes have a different algebraic concept that is still fulfilled by this algebraic structure. Um, but yeah, I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself. This will be the next slide. Uh, we, we have with Hopf algebras also a notion of quasi-triangularity. Quasi um, this means when we, in addition to having a Hopf algebra, 
find an invertible element R um, that satisfies both the co-commutativity equation, which is this one here, as well as the fusion relations, then it is quasi-triangular. Why are we from an integrability perspective interested in this? It turns out that if we find such, an, uh, such a universal R matrix in our Hopf algebra, then um, that, that satisfies these properties, then it automatically satisfies the quantum Young-Baxter equation. Um, this, I'm, I'm not going to reiterate the notation again. This was very well explained by Anna um, in her course. I'm sure it's familiar to most of you, but this is just the link between Hopf algebras and integrable systems that I'm trying to make. And before I was getting ahead of myself a little bit. So as I said, uh, there is sometimes algebraic structures that don't um, fulfill co-associativity, but they, so they, they fulfill what is called quasi-co-associativity. This means that they fulfill this kind of relation with some, uh, with some co-associator, which is a element in an invertible element in the triple tensor product. As you can see that, if a algebraic structure fulfills this kind of uh, relation for the co associator be, being equal to one, we exactly have the same notion as we did before. So this is then the normal um, co associativity. Otherwise, if it's not equal to one, we are talking about quasi co associativity. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to reiterate. Um, there's a question, yes. So uh, I was wondering whether it's a language thing. So is this uh, quasi Young Baxter equation the same thing as what is called sometimes the twisted Young Baxter equation that you have, for instance, the Lincoln for Korean means when you are in the spin chain frame, or is it something else? Um, I think it must be. I mean, sometimes it's also called the generalized uh, Young Baxter equation. I'm not sure if this is if you if you have heard about it in this context. I expect it to be, but I would have to look at it um, in detail in order to say if it's really that. Thanks. No worries. Um, as I said, so we talked about quasi Hopf algebras, but there also exists a notion of quasi triangularity in quasi Hopf algebras. Um, it sounds more complicated than it is. This is also just a, um, as uh, Alessandro was already pointing out, a generalization of our of the of the Young Baxter equation that we already know, and we can see that. If all these co-associators, I'm not going to introduce the notation too much, are equal to one, then we arrive at our normal notion of uh, of Young-Baxter equations again. Okay. So this was my uh, introduction to what we are dealing with, and the algebras and everything. Now I want to delve into concrete representations. So first of all, we are going to do. Um, we're focusing on the massless case. So whenever you see a um, dispersion relation or anything of that kind, it's going to be the massless dispersion relation. This will be very important when we talk about co-products. I will specify that there. So in the boson-fermionic basis, which is just one uh, boson, one fermion, we have that we choose our um, fermion fermions to be uh, like this. And you can already see that this has massively simplifying implications for all the central elements and for all the um, yeah Cartan elements because we chose we choose them to coincide like the SL and QR for example um, but so far I haven't really said how I imagine the boost to be in this picture so this is this was just normal SU1 slash one um, I pro we propose or I propose these kinds of relation for a boost for our boost um, mu here is just some constant involving h which is more related to the string theory behind it but not really important for the algebraic analysis and uh, whenever you see some kind of label down here that that can be left-handed or right-handed if not specified otherwise i mean you know that our algebra is two sides okay and we have to think about, okay, we now have a representation for fermions. These, fer these representations for the fermions also imply how we uh, want our uh, central elements and our Cartan elements to look like in the representation, but we don't really know how the boost wants to look like. So a prototypic um, representation of the boost is this one on the bottom of my slide. 
Uh, why is it prototypic? Because if, an, uh, if a boost in this form acts on the momentum generator, we immediately get uh, H. So that's kind of like the motivation where this comes from. Yeah, hope this is uh, clear so far. We will see these relations many times. Okay. Um, so now we have di discussed everything on the level of the algebra that we're looking at. Uh, it is time for us to also talk about how we want to uh, do a Hopf algebraic setting with this. And we, for the massless undeformed case, we choose very general fermionic co-products. Here, A, B, C, and D can be, uh, I guess, any, any um, real numbers. Yeah. It, algebraically, it also works with complex numbers, but then the gradings get a bit unphysical in a sense, and it's not really clear what physically we're dealing with. If we start with this kind of, uh, with these kind of fermionic co-products and the same for the right-handed side, by the way, um, we all, we have to make sure that the co-products of our central elements are, um, are also central. So this means if we have these two uh, co-products for, and opposite co-products for H, we would want them to coincide. This now gives us a, restrict, a restriction on what A, B, C, and D can be the one, the kind of parameters that we had in our initial braiding of fermion co-products. Co Here, um, we find two families and I have to maybe specify something. Not all of these, uh, not all of these A, B, C, D are physical. Sometimes, I mean, we can always redefine our fermionic generators by some bosonic braiding. Um, e to the sum factor times pi times p. And we can see that only the a minus c and b minus d, the differences of these braiding factors matter, but we will see this in the, uh, in, the, in the effective calculation later on more precisely, but just to have said it at this point already. Yes, so as I said, this restriction is providing us with two families. The first one is rather, uh, well, rather simple because in the end, this just means that our Cartan generator or the co-product of our Cartan generator H um, is unbraided, so it's primitive in Hopf algebraic language. But we also receive a second family, which we call bosonically braided, where we still have some exponential factors in the co-product of H. And this really only works because we are dealing with the massless dispersion relation which has a nice exponential structure. And it's really, it's more of a coincidence in my mind that this works because normally energy and uh, P generators always have primitive co-products, but for the, massless, uh, for the massless case, both deformed and undeformed as we will see, we also can make sense of a great co-product. So these are the two families that we get. Okay, so now we discussed everything on the Hopf algebraic side. Now we want to see is there some notion of quasi-triangularity that we can embed in this? For this, because we are in a representation, we also need to uh, introduce some kind of or introduce some kind of ansatz for our R that we can calculate with in this representation. Um, so we are making here in order to for R to fulfill this quasi co commutativity this co commutativity um, condition a six vertex ansatz which is normalized. And it turns out if we assume, if we make this ansatz and we want this to co-commute with, with the co-products and opposite co-products of all fermionic elements, we arrive at um, an R matrix expression for both bosonically graded and unbraided families. I mean, I don't want to like discuss too much about what we found, but it's just for you to say that these R matrices still depend on the braiding, as you can see, um, as we expect, so that doesn't drop out. And wherever you see an E or an E1, this is just a massless dispersion relation as, as I mentioned before. Okay. Okay. So we have now discussed uh, our matrices and the, co and the Hopf algebra structure of everything but the boost, but we kind of weaseled our way around about what we expect the co-product of our J to look like. Um, of course, there is a natural part of, uh, of the co-product, which we call the kinetic 
part, which comes just com comes from the kind of representation that we chose uh, for our boost. But of course, it can have some bosonic or fermionic tail that might not be um, guessable, might not be visible on the level of non hopf algebraic considerations. So we make it a general ansatz that it can involve this kind of uh, a, so a and b correspond to this um, kinetic part and uh, c c to g like the coefficient functions that are now as of now undetermined um, correspond to the fermionic tail okay so maybe i have to say how we get this ansatz so in general for example you can see that the b operator uh, has if act B acts on J, we have zero. So of course, on the co-product level, this still has to be fulfilled. Um, and apart from that, I would just say in a kind of direct way, we just try to start with the most general ansatz for the co-product of J and C, if we have the necessary freedom in order to make this algebraically consistent. Okay, so about five slides, slides ago, I talked about uh, impo in, about algebra homomorphism property of our co-product. And I also said that this is going to be important for us later on. This is exactly the point where this is uh, playing a role. So if we want to have um, a co-product for our boost generator that is on the Hopf algebraic level consistent, it has to fulfill the algebra homomorphism property with um, any other generator. But it turns out that if we impose it for the fermionic part only, that's already enough for the whole algebra because how the fermions look immediately uh, also, of, of course, uh, dictates the structure <coughs> of, um, of the central and the Cartan elements. And indeed, we find a um, uh, co-product tail, a whole co-product of J that is consistent of algebraically with, um, with, with all the other generators. And these are, the, uh, these are the coefficients. I will not discuss them at length, but just know that we find something. Here, one thing that I would want to point out that is kind of interesting is all these relations that we used so far don't fix this uh, co-product, like definitely. We still have some freedoms. So wherever you see upsilon and beta, these can be arbitrary functions that are that just, just parameterize the freedom that we still have left after all of our Hopf algebraic machinery. And in, indeed, they fulfill interesting relations uh, with the R matrix, which is kind of coincidental, and we don't really know where the origin from this comes from. So as I said, I mean, you can also, if you have these kinds of uh, um, coefficients and you see where the upsilon appears, you can also re-express your upsilon freedom in terms of a tensor product uh, algebra notation. So if you know it appears in C, you take this, you know, I think it's pretty clear. And if you, if you use the parameterization of upsilon as a operator freedom, as a operator, this freedom in, a, in some sense, for example, for the, uh, I think, unbraided family has a very particular relation that it fulfills with the R matrices that we found. Kind of looks like a um, evolution equation for the R matrix, which uh, is really amazing because if you know about the form of upsilon, you can immediately get your R matrix without anything, without knowing anything too particular about the algebra. Um, so there has to be some connection that we are not able to fully grasp yet, but it's certainly very interesting. Okay, so, so far I've talked about the massless undeformed case. Now I will delve into the massless deformed case. So all the other, um, uh, the direct relations are still valid, but, but we, we have to deform the energy at this point. So now we're in this Q deformed territory and these are now the relations that we deal with. Alpha and beta are just, um, um, constants with, with some Q dependence that uh, one can look up in our paper, but this is the structure that we have now. And this time when we deal with fermionic co-products, we will, we will not make a whole story of general ratings out of it, but we will uh, try to get one or 
focus on one of one representative of each class. So one of them, um, the the first one is is going to be the unbraided co-product that we that we consider uh, in a representative manner. The other one, the other fermionic co-products are braided, as you can see just by the signs of of our exponential braiding. And for this, we are making the whole machinery again. I will just skip this again. So we, we make algebra, we make an we uh, we make an ansatz for R. Yes. Can I just uh, oh, sorry? Uh, can I just see the formula for the energy again? Just the formula for the energy. I mean, it's still uh, it's still our uh, massless dispersion relation. But, it's but, Q deformed. I mean, wait, wait, wait. do you mind just going back to the slides so I can just uh, sure. Just sort of this. There was one. Was it this slide? Oh, no, oh, you did not write. Okay, so it's just um, like something like cinch the hyperbolic sine mm -hmm. of E is equal to sine of P. Or can you say that again? The hyperbolic sine of E is equal to sine of P. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we use the, the whole machinery again. Um, we make an ansatz for our R matrices, which will again be the six word, six vertex ansatz, and we uh, uh, we arrive at uh, at R matrices for both the braided and the unbraided co-products. For the unbraided energy, they look like this, um, and for the Braided one, they are a bit simpler, and uh, this is the form that we got here. Yes. But now we have to deal with the J co products again, and we have to make ansatzes again. So we, uh, we, we make exactly that. We, we already know a bit what to expect from the undeformed case. Yes. Just a question uh, can you express your boost in? in terms of fermionic generators uh, as an appropriate anti-commutator or something like that. Can you say that again? Can you express the boost in terms of a quadratic expression in fermionic charges? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we, we always, um, the boost was kind of something that we, as on a purely bosonic, so you were saying, the question was, I don't know, maybe one, one didn't hear, if, if the boost operator, which is a bosonic operator, can be expressed as some quadratic um, algebraic object in fermionic operators. And I don't think, uh, I mean, we didn't look, that, we look at that, but I don't think that's the case. We always looked at the J coming from outside and we didn't find such a relation. Okay. Well, I mean, may, maybe there is something, it would be nice to discuss about that, but. Yeah, the J is kind of separate from the rest of the algebra in this sense. Okay, so we are back at the um, ansatz for our um, for the co-products of J. So here we have the unbraided one, and I'm going to be a bit quick here because of because it's quite technical in the end. Um, and uh, the here, but the one thing I need to say here for the unbraided case is. On the other side of the algebra homomorphism property equation, you also have to take the some kind of um, co-product of the functions if, uh, in front of the fermionic generators, and this is, in a sense, this is the, uh, the co-product of sin sinus p. And of course, you can. This is not really unambiguous. So sometimes you can express it just as p. Sometimes you can take the energy into account or anything in between. So whatever you get in the unbraided cases depends on the form of the co-product of these functions uh, that, you, that you have. So it, it, it is in a sense a choice. Of course, there's also so solutions then for all the other coefficients, but in order to be a bit more succinct, um, I'm just presenting this bit. We have we did the same game again again for braided co-products uh, for the braided energy and uh, we also made an ansatz here just be aware that we um, defined outside or we kind of re we absorbed absorbed to the outside of the coefficients some bosonic q factors and this leads then to this expression here we don't have this kind of ambiguity with the co-product of sinus of p and all of these things. 
So yes. So we are in a, here in a monastery and I have to make a confession. In a sense, I have not really been fully honest with you um, because it turns out that one of the co-products that we chose uh, for the energy is not, because, because we have also braided energy co-products, does not give rise to a co-associative structure. Here, there is a typo, this should be braided. Um, and if we don't have a co-associative structure in our, fermion, in our fermions, then this also means we cannot furnish a Hopf algebraic structure out of it. Now, how do, how do we remedy this? Um, in the beginning of my talk, I said that there exists some equivalent or some more general load notions of Hopf algebras that are quasi Hopf algebras. And it turns out that for the braided uh, energy co product case and, um, and the deformed, Q deformed case, we have exactly that. And we can find a co associator that. Uh, that exactly that uh, makes our uh, structure into a quasi hopf algebraic structure. Maybe just to put this in context to some physics, this um, co-associator that we have here is one in the case where we have co-associativity. And it turns out that these omegas that we have had to define here exactly measure um, by what amount our uh, energy co-product, like which, which also can be seen as a two-particle energy, which also can be seen as within a two-particle energy um, interpretation, this omega exactly measures um, by what amount our energy is not primitive. So that's quite interesting. We found. Sorry, then the question. Uh, is this non co associativity um, that already uh, without taking into account the boost? Because there's no J in this slide. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, um, this is already without the boost. I mean, maybe I should have been more clear about this. So, the, the non co associativity or the quasi co associativity of this structure already arises when we just have the Q deformation and the uh, Braided energy co products. As you can see, I mean, where it fails is already this, these fermionic relations, which do not know anything about boosts, which do not know anything about boost co, -product, boost co products yet. So it's really even more fundamental. And do you know if it is possible, forgetting about the boost, sure. so that's not part of your algebra anymore, mm -hmm. if it is possible to uh, construct a different, co a different co product for the remaining generators, uh, such that. Uh, after Q deforming, you you still have a co-associative uh, structure. That's a very good question. So I I said that this is only the case for one of the families. So this is only the case for the braided family. If you have you need you really need two things. You need both braidedness of the co-product of the energy and Q deformation. For example, if you have a Q deformed system that has a uh, primitive energy, uh, like a primitive energy product, co-product, then you have co-associativity. Or if you have a braided uh, energy co-product, but not the Q deformation. So when you forget about the boost, uh, you can for also forget about bradedness and that's why you restore the co-associativity. Is that the idea? Um, the braiding of the energy operators a priori doesn't really have anything to do with the boosts. I mean, <clears throat> But there, you need it, but you need it to in order to have a co-product which is a Lie algebra isomorphism, no? In this case, when the boost is present, you're forced to have it. The braiding? Yes. No, I mean we are we are able to construct boosts and boost co-products for both unbraided and braided co-products. Okay. I mean maybe for Miguel has something to add, but I think that's the picture, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So yeah, so, so far about this uh, non co associative case, but um, I, I was a bit kind of uh, not really honest because I've already found an R matrix. I've already postulated some kind of uh, quasi triangularity, but I used uh, um, the Young-Baxter equation, but within quasi hopf algebras, I need to use the quasi hopf algebra, quasi Young-Baxter equation or the generalized Young-Baxter equation. Yes. Sorry, one precision. <coughs> 
regarding the this uh, unbraided unbraided case this is just a case of your how you distribute your program that you showed in the beginning ABC. exactly um, right. but this is just in continuation with regard and I, I was wondering if you can maybe at the end you can comment on your epsilon because a priori what you just mentioned for the young Baxter if you go with the quasi triangular structures it's usually sufficient to know the structure of the hop algebra and the, your extension for the quasi triangle, which involves the, uh, the R structure. Namely, uh, so that your R will be already uh, con constrained enough by just by co commutativity. And in principle, you, you wouldn't need any extra deformation parameters, which with, this is, I, I presumably, what you ask for the uh, evolution equation mm -hmm. for the R and epsilon. So you think, in a sense, it's natural that. Uh... Or, okay, yeah, I understand what you're asking. Maybe. I think this is just an analog. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I just, at the moment, I cannot establish what is the relation with these. Sure. If, if there no. is a relation between these two. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting comment, but I, I maybe I, I also have to say that I wasn't quite honest. I mean, not all of the, I mean, you, you said that also in the R matrix, you have these parameters A, B, C, D appearing that you have in the, you know, in the braidings, as you yeah. say. And not all of these R matrices fulfill Young Baxter. So, so although we have like families, we have unbraided and unbraided. Uh, exactly, and there is, uh, yeah, okay. Exactly. Maybe there is yeah. also other point which is related to the generalized Greenfield co-product, which probably will have additional phases which would contain this in French, but I'm just not sure. Yeah, I mean, um, so you're saying maybe there's some connection, but it's probably not as transparent, right? Yeah, that may be, yeah, I mean, maybe I wasn't clear with that. Mm -hmm. But thanks for the comment. Okay, so as I said, I wasn't quite honest. We need to make use of the generalized Young-Baxter equation when we want to deal with quasi-helpful algebras. And it turns out because our co-associator that I showed before is not proportional to the identity in any sense because then we would just have a co-associative structure, but it has this B. B in our, um, B in our representation is diagonal but not proportional to the identity. But this still means whatever co-associator we needed for this to be co to, to for this to be a quasi help algebra is simple. It's not um, it's not a hugely complicated matrix structure once it's expressed in terms of a representation. <laughs> and it even turns out that if we uh, if we take the sandwich product between brass and cats, we're able to see that the generalized Young Baxter equation and the normal a usual quantum young Baxter equation are indeed um, equivalent for our case, so that we check the young Baxter is already implying generalized young Baxter, and we have quasi hope. Okay, so so far I've I've talked about the mass if case. I will try to speed up a bit. The massless case, the massive case for the undeformed case has already been uh, looked at by uh, Ali and uh, Ricardo. Um, and for the deformed case, this is what I kind of would skip over. This is now where I'm trying to make progress myself. Again, um, one can try to come up with the same game. One can, one can choose a representation um, and try to make this whole hop algebra and quasi-commutativity machinery work. There are some kind of, I would say, computational issues with that. Um, because we have both mass and uh, Q deformation present, the terms that we get are really, in a sense, involved. And sometimes it, it's even not clear, for example, if you have such a function, what is it on the level of the co-product? Uh, for example, if you only have energy and momentum present, as in the massless case, because the Zhukovsky parameterization simplifies there, it's easier to make sense of it. In other more involved uh, parameterization, it's not. There's also different uh, one plus one dimensional short reps that one can choose and again find R matrices and then see uh, what the intricacies of the problems are. Okay. So for the last bit of my talk, I think I have about five or six minutes left. I'm going to talk about something that was more recently done by us. So far, I've always talked about representations, representations, representations. I've always looked into uh, one plus one dimensional representations in any case that I talked about. But it's also, prob it's also 
we can also make sense of the representation independent case. So we're looking at this from a algebraically universal perspective. We have to postulate some things though, because the momentum is not really apparent anymore in the sense that we have before. So we have to make some sense, sensible postulate, postulates before about, uh, about the, how we expect the, um, yeah, the algebraic relations to be now. And I think the most uh, central one uh, in, in the non-algebraic sense is this one. So this is kind of the building block uh, we introduce these kinds of curly delta functions and we see what kind of properties they have to have for the Hopf algebra on the algebraic level that we get out of this to be consistent. If one looks at it in terms of, again, the uh, action of some kind of momentum, uh, of some kind of momentum derivative, one can immediately see that it has to be some kind of Jacobian, but uh, because we're dealing, we're not dealing in this uh, representation, we have to leave it a bit more abstract. And one thing that I also have to say is here, we are not immediately assuming PR and PL to be coincise, coinciding. So we expect that the momentum of the left-handed and the right-handed uh, right-handed algebra of SU1 slash one can be in any state correlated, anti-correlated or completely independent. This will then be uh, apparent when, you, when we talk about what kind of deltas we have. For this, um, for this I, but I still have to kind of talk a bit about additional material that we need. So the SU1 comma one, the SU1 slash one algebra, the, the one that commutes with the Hamiltonian, had don't, does not only have a B operator as an outer symmetry, but in fact, it has a very large outer symmetry group GL2 of which the B can be just shuffled in in some sense, like it's just one of the parameter com uh, combinations. <coughs> this, I mean, what you have to get away from this slide is just that there exist some kind of generators that transform the fermions into one another that rotate them and also rotate the central elements amongst each other. That's, I think, everything that's important from here um, on a conceptual level. And we will see how they how they come into play right afterwards. So, how do we find these curly delta functions? Um, how which which values of the curly delta functions are allowed? Which functional uh, properties are allowed for the algebra to be consistent? For this, we have to really make use of every, everything that our algebra has, um, especially Jacobi relations. And if we do that, for example, here and make some symmetry considerations, make further arguments we arrive at equations like this. And if we assume that um, delta LR, the, the, the kind of these have to vanish independently, this gives rise to six different families. So we have six different al algebras uh, on the universal level. As I'm a bit short on time and as I pl planned anyways, I will just um, focus on this algebra here. But it can, be, it can be shown that they are um, interconnected in some web. And it's really interesting, like what kind of properties arise from there. We have the notion of differential and separable algebras because the differential ones um, fulfill some kind of inverse function theorem. If, if we uh, assume the deltas to really be Jacobi functions and the separable ones just split in two sides because one of the sides uh, has delta equals zero. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I will be really brief about that. We just have to assume because here, like in these actions, we assumed PL and PR, we had no assumptions about how they might correlate or anti-correlate. We have to make, we have to kind of uh, take into account the fact of exactly that. And that means that we have to not use the normal partial derivative as we did before, but we have to uh, use the convective or the material derivative as people do in fluid mechanics and all other kinds of analysis in order to make sense of the boost acting as a some kind of differential momentum operator in this representation. Um, otherwise it doesn't work. Otherwise all the algebraic relations on the level of the representations get broken. Oh, no, no, this is not the co-associator. This is, uh, you mean this this thing, huh? 
the, the combination, I mean, the algebraic combination, yes. No, this is, uh, this is actually what you get when you act with J on H. I was really brief in the beginning. I was really brief about that. That's, that just comes from one. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for pointing that out. And we really need to make use of this convective derivative in our differential representation of the boost. Otherwise, it is not algebraically consistent. So that was kind of something that also took us a while to realize, but it makes sense considering after the fact. Okay. So as a last part here, I will just really briefly talk about one of the algebras. Um, the, as I told you, like we have six different algebras and all of them have like a very, very thorough uh, algebraic analysis. Some of them you can classify into uh, known algebras. Some of them are a bit more intricate, but because in the representation case, we also um, dealt with, PR, with PL is equal to PR, which corresponds to this algebra. It makes sense for me to now see what happens on the universal case and the universal framework for this uh, algebra. And one can see that because this has to hold, um, if you look at the dispersion relations, um, or if you, if you look at the kind of structure that you assume H to have, um, you can make this kind of algebra out of it with some restrictions on what H A and H B can be. And um, doing again, like the same game as we have before, but not deformed. So uh, as I said, we're in the undeformed case for fermionic co-products that look like this. We then can make a boost on the on the representation independent level. Of course, I mean, if we say that this is now the boost for an algebra that we don't really care what the representation is of, we have to get the same result if we project this into the representation that we used in the part of my talk where we still considered representations. And um, it turns out that this exactly works. So uh, if, if we go to the differential rep using our convective derivative as a as, as, uh, as kind of the differential bit of our uh, uh, momentum of our boost operator plus uh, you know what we propose the fermions to look like we exactly get what we have before and here this is also why I had to introduce the external symmetry of the algebra it turns out that using ingredients from within the algebra only does not give rise to a consistent co-product of J. So we really have to make use of these kinds of uh, combinations of outer symmetry generators for the co-product to make sense and to be consistent. So it really got a bit more mathematically involved. Okay. Um, so the natural question to ask, and this is now one of my last slides, um, as we saw before, we, we have to make use of this outer symmetry in order for the co-products of J to be there uh, on the, on the uni und undeformed universal level. So the natural question is, what about Q-deformation? Can we make sense of this universal picture in a Q-deformed setting? It turns out this GL2-2 outer symmetry of our SU1-1 uh, algebra does not survive in the Q-deformation kills it and only some kind of abelian part survives that is sadly not enough for us to make the co-product work on the universal Q deformed level. However, there have been some kind of um, efforts, uh, most notably by uh, Vidas, to make sense of a symmetry that can be lifted to this point. And it would uh, for us be very interesting if we could make sense of the boost co-product then in this later uh, in this framework too. And as a last slide, um, I feel like I need to point out what is really interesting about this for me. So far, I've really talked about a lot of algebra. I briefly introduced the setting that we're in, but if, if we cannot really say what is the meaning, can we at least say what's the point? And we can. So the boost operator has, it has proven by Young and others to be uh, very, closely connected with the symmetries of the R matrix. For example, if the R matrix, as everybody knows, is a symmetry, or if the boost is a symmetry of the R matrix, so on the, the product level, the R matrix is, is, is already in different form. So if you have, so there are really intricate connections between the boost, um, between uh, the uniform Ising variable associated to the boost, 
R matrices, R matrices in different form, and the ambiguities of like these things. So we really want to explore this further and uh, see if we can get something more concise out of it. And as a last thing, I would also say, as you might have seen now from a mathematical perspective, we always had to make use of different tools. So it's also really interesting to work with these kinds of structures. Um, for example, in the Q-deform thing, you had to make use of, of uh, outer symmetry generators. It's, it seems to be always a bit more uh, involved. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what kind of, yes, challenges that the other cases that we want to tackle uh, imply. And with this, I thank you for your uh, attention and I'm here for questions. Questions? Uh, I would have a technical question because honestly, you know, I didn't understand the logic and philosophy of your talk from a physical point of view. But mathematical, mathematically, as far as I understood, you have some algebra, you want to promote it to the Hopf algebra, is it? Your algebra, original algebra is simple. Um, that's a bit difficult. I mean, you have, of course, the notion of simple and semi-simple, these super algebras, for example, for SU1 slash one, I'm sure you know this very well. So what you're asking is if I take now the boost into this, if I look no, at- I ask you whether algebra is simple. This is very clear mathematical notion. This is about the existence of ideals. Um, yeah, I mean, do we have some non-trivial? Uh, I, I don't think so, no. Yeah, but so maybe from- Then me, if you have no non-trivial ideals, uh, it for me is astonishing. All of this was classified long time ago in the simpler case that what which what structure can be promoted the Hopf algebra this is all known so i don't understand what we do and if it's simple so how you tell me that j cannot be expressed in terms of fermionic generator if it's simple it must be expressible in terms of yeah. fermionic generators and in this case there is no point to choose the ansatz for, for boost because it follows from the co-product on fermions. So uh, I really, I didn't understand what you, what you did. If you tell me that you don't know whether your algebra to deform is simple, this is not a good sign. So, sorry, we have a comment from Alessandro Torielli that the algebras are not simple. Yeah, I think they're not simple. I, I just don't know about uh, now the precise ideals. I wouldn't know them off the top of my head. But... If, if, if I may comment, they have center. So the, the moment they have a center, you have non-trivial ideals. Um, and also, if you remove all the centers and you go to PSU1 slash 1, that's also not simple because you have an ideal which is just the two borels. So, Wait, Alexander, it, if this is just a problem of center, do you agree with him that you cannot express boost in terms of fermionic generators? I do, yeah. It's not possible. Strange film. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I have a question about, um, so if I understand correctly, most of what you do can pretty much be done for the complexifier. I mean, it goes through if you complexify everything. Um, yeah, I think so too. I mean, uh, we didn't look at it, but it looks sen sensible. So yeah. I guess there is this, I mean, if you have a, in the massless case, you have this dispersion relation, which is um, sinh equals sine. Uh, if you go to the kind of uh, uh, root of unity or the phase uh, Q branch, then this will become sine equals sine. And for some value of Q and H, sorry, um, I guess this sort of, might reduce to the relativistic, well, up to shifts of two pi, yeah. but at least that one solution would be the relativistic uh, dispersion. Does anything nice happen to all of your algebraic structure at this at this point? Or? Yeah, I mean, we didn't consider this point, so I don't really have a smart answer for this, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. So another question. Did you understand correctly that the uh, universal formulation was done only for the massless case. Mm -hmm. So did you try to extend it to the massive one? 
Um, not yet, but maybe I have to say why we why this case why we accept why we say that this thing is massless. I mean, you have, for example, you have first of all you have the notion of different handed momenta. This thing doesn't really isn't really as sensible in the in the massive case. I mean, you can make that you can make that kind of assumption when you have um, you know these decoupled massless uh, algebras that you have, but in the massive case you don't. So, but your question is whether I, whether we try to lift this to the massive case. I mean, for this to be true, I mean, this, this would then now kind of per, build on work that you did, right? I mean, with the, with the massive thing, but we didn't try, but I accept, I expect this like to be a lot more complicated because the algebra then looks a bit different and whether the sides commute, uh, whether, whether the two sides, the left-handed and right-handed side, communicate with each other, which we now parameterize by the momenta, is then somehow being disturbed by also having a mass that, you know, gives kind of a, uh, a way that the two sides are related. So I the hope of working out the universal formulation in the massive case is uh, motivated by the ADS5 case. It would be, yeah. Yeah, because it would be very nice to work out the ADS5 case. Very much so, the, yeah. Already the undeformed one. Mm -hmm. Because then this uh, boost generator would, uh, if not completely fix, at least uh, give you a lot of information on the dressing phase of mm -hmm. the, the R matrix, already, yeah. in, already in, in universal form. Yeah, I agree. I mean, for the ADS5, which is mass only, that, that would be really interesting to work out. I think so too. Yeah, but we haven't done that yet. So, I mean, the universal case, so. Any other questions? I don't see any hands, so let's thank Leander again.